What is going on guys welcome back to the algorithms and data structures tutorial series in today's episode we're going to learn about the big O notation so in the last video we talked about runtime complexity asymptotic growth and today we're going to learn about a way to write down uh, what asymptotic growth a certain runtime complexity or function has so we're going to look at different examples it's going to be quite a mathematical episode we're going to uh, do some calculations and equations here uh, to figure out how to use the big O notation properly. So let us get right into it. So the big O notation is essentially just a mathematical way of writing down which function is limiting another function. So uh, imagine you have the function f of n here and this function is something like 50n and then you have g of n and g of n is just n squared. Now if we use a coordinate system here to plot these two functions what you can see is that you have a pretty steep linear function and then you also have n squared, essentially. Now this is not n squared, actually. Something like that would be n squared. But uh, as we saw in the last video, there will be some points since n squared is uh, growing way faster than n, uh, where n squared is going to intersect with 50n and then n squared is go going to dominate 50n, obviously. Now, what we say mathematically here is that there is a point from which on n squared is going to limit 50n, which means that there is one starting index, let's call it big N or uppercase N. Uh, and this starting index, for, from this starting index on, we can say that for each N that is larger than the starting index, we can say that N squared is going to be larger than 50n. Now for the big O notation, we can add something more we can say that this is even true if we have, or we can use the big O notation even if we have a constant. So essentially, if I have any constant here, uh, and this constant could be a trillion, a million, whatever you want, just some constant of the real numbers maybe uh, as a limitation, multiplied by that n squared, and then choosing a starting index. And if that is always true, if this in equation here, inequality here, is always true, then we can say that 50n is in big O of n squared. This is how you write it down. Um, the equal sign here, don't confuse it. Essentially, if you were to treat it mathematically accurate, you would have to say 50n is an element of O of n squared because O of n squared is essentially a set. And this set uh, is every function that is limited by n squared. Now, limited by n squared is exactly that. It means that I can choose a constant c multiply it uh, with n squared and then this here is always going to be larger than um, than some function on the right and this is true for infinitely many n starting at a certain uppercase n as a, at a certain starting index this left thing here is always going to be larger than the right one so in this case it's pretty obvious that n squared is going to be or 50n is going to be in um, big O of n squared, but I can also do this for something like 17 n squared plus, uh, I don't know, 5 n plus 30, for example, this is also in big O of n squared, even though n squared is actually less than 17 n squared. Uh, this is still true, because if I uh, solve this, or actually not this one, but if I say uh, 17 n squared plus 5 n plus 30, is always going to be less than n squared times any constant. Uh, and this is true for infinitely many n's. I can definitely if I solve this in equation here inequality here, I can definitely find a c and a starting index n for which this is true. And this means that essentially, uh, the left term here, the left function here is in big O of n squared. This is what this big O actually means. Now, this is not the case, for example, if I take something like, um, I don't know, uh, 30, or actually not just let, let's say n to the power of three. And I say n to the power of three is always going to be less than uh, n squared times any constant. This is not true, because there will be a point eventually, because what what is this essentially saying, this means it's n times n squared is always going to be less than n squared times c. Now, whatever constant I choose, I can find eventually if I go towards infinity, uh, I can always reach an n that is going to be larger than c. And as soon as I reach that n, 
it's no longer going to be true. So the inequality is not going to always be true or to be true for infinitely many values. I cannot find a C in a starting index uppercase N for which this inequality is going to be always true. Therefore, N squared is not in big O of N to the power. Uh, oh, this is true. Sorry. N to the power of three. So N cubed is not in big O of N squared. This is not the case in the same way N squared, of course, is not in big O of N and so on. So whenever you can find a constant and a starting index for which this type of inequality is always going to be true, then you can say that the left function is in big O of the right function. So it's limited. It's the upper boundary. It's limited by that function. Now we can also go ahead and do this the other way around with something called the omega notation. So it's essentially the same thing as the big O notation, just the other way around. So you're trying to find a function uh, that is bounded below by another function. So essentially just the same thing the other way around. You have f of n and this is some some function here. I don't know. Then you have g of n, another function. And, you know, we, we talked about if f of n is always less than g of n times a certain constant for uh, every index n that is larger than a starting index n and this uh, n is going to be larger than zero. And we can also say c is larger than zero. Um, what you can say is that essentially then if this is the case f of n is in big O of g of n. And now you can swap this around and you can say, okay, if f of n is always larger than g of n times a constant for all n larger than some starting index with uh, c and the starting index being larger than zero, greater than zero. Um, if this is the case, you can say that f of n is bounded below by g of n. And this essentially means that f of n is in omega. Okay, this is not a very beautiful omega sign here in omega of g of n. This is essentially just the other way around, um, which essentially means if you can find any c and the c can be something like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, just not negative and not zero. Uh, if you can find a number that you a constant that you multiply with the function um, or the term. So so this expression here on the right, um, and you can find a starting index, uppercase n and for all n's larger than that index for all n's from a certain index onwards to infinity. This inequality here is true, then you can say it's an omega of g of n. It's the same thing as the big O notation just the other way around. And also if you can say it's both. So if let's write it down mathematically, if f of n is in big O of g of n, and f of n is in omega of g of n. This essentially means that f of n is in theta of g of n, which essentially means that they have the same asymptotic growth. For example, you can say, um, what did we have? 17 n squared plus 6 n plus, I don't know, 25. This is in big O of n squared, for example, at the same time, 17 uh, n squared plus 6 n plus 25 is in omega of n squared, because you can find a constant so that n squared is always less than this, uh, this left piece of mathematical expressions here. Uh, and this essentially means that 17 n squared plus 6 n plus 25 is in theta of n squared. And this obviously also means that n squared is in theta of 17 n squared plus 6 n plus 25. And this essentially means that they have the same asymptotic growth. So there, you could say there ha they have a very similar uh, efficiency, same asymptotic growth runtime complexity, so to say. So what you do when you're treating algorithms essentially is when you end up with something like uh, this is the amount of expressions, uh, not expressions, what was it primitive operations that we do, uh, you can essentially say that the runtime complexity of the algorithm is in O of n squared, you're not going to say it's in O of 17 n squared or something. When you analyze an algorithm, and the result is something like the primitive operations worst case are something like seven steps for sure, then 12 n and then I don't know, 24 n squared and 
three n to the power of three, because you somehow calculated that you analyzed that it essentially just boils down to the algorithm has a runtime complexity of big O of n to the power of three, the cubic runtime complexity, that's essentially it. That's how you write it. It's also uh, the same, you can also say it's in theta of n to the power of three, because this is this doesn't give us a lot of information, because I can also say, of course, it's in big O of n to the power of 20 wouldn't be wrong. But it's not necessarily what I'm looking for. So maybe the theta notation here is more useful, you just say it's in theta n to the power of three, which means that that is the asymptotic growth of that uh, runtime complexity. So now let's go through an actual example here that you might uh, be given in college. So this is the function that we have, and we have to show that this function that it is in big O of n squared, that is something that we need to show. This is our task right now. So let's go through it mathematically correct. What you need to do is you need to show that this thing here is less than c times n squared, c can be any number. And uh, this is true for all n, uh, n's bigger than or larger than some uh, uppercase n. And uh, we need to find this uppercase n here, and we need to find the c in order to prove that this is the case. So what you can do here is you can just go ahead and divide both sides by n squared. So you have 32 plus 17 divided by n plus five divided by n squared. And then you have <clears throat> has to be less than c. Now, essentially, you could go ahead and just prove it by choosing a ridiculously high c and a ridiculously high n because it's going to be true. Eventually, you know, you can just go ahead and say c is 1 billion and uh, uppercase n is 1 trillion, it's going to be true, who cares. Uh, but we want to get a somehow uh, not ridiculous solution, you want to have not necessarily the best uh, solution, not necessarily the smallest possible values, but you want to have something that um, is reasonable that we can work with. So what you want to do is you want to definitely um, find a c that is larger than these numbers on the left. So what you want to do is you want to have uh, a c value that is going to be definitely larger than 32, because since n is going to be a positive number, uh, we're going to have a number that is definitely going to be larger than 32. So what you can do, for example, is you can just say, okay, let's say c is 34. Uh, what I need to do then is I need to find uh, a capital uh, or a uppercase n here, uh, capital n here that is going to make sure that all the other n's that are bigger, larger than this n, are going to result in these two fractions here being less than one. Because if these two are less than one, I have 32 plus one plus one, and this has to be less than 34 then. So I can see that 17 divided by n is going to be less than one when n is larger than uh, 17. And for this one, it's the same because if I have n is larger than 17, I'm going to have 17 squared and 17 squared is definitely going to make this fraction here less than uh, one. So I essentially can say, okay, if n is larger or equal to 18, not 11, sorry, 18, and uh, c is 34, that is the proof that this left expression here is in big O of n squared, because I can just go ahead and say, okay, 32 n squared plus 17 n plus five is always going to be less than uh, not c, sorry, we already calculated c 34 times n squared for all n's that are larger or equal to 18. And this is obviously the case because um, we showed that it's the case by eliminating or not eliminating but looking at these fractions here and the moment that I pass the number 18 for the index, I'm definitely going to have a larger uh, product on the right side or a larger number on the right side here. So this is definitely proven. And this is how you can prove mathematically that this left expression here is in big O of n squared. So that's it for today's video about big O notation. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting the like button, leaving some comments in the comment section down below and subscribing to this channel if you want to see more future videos for free. In the next video, we're going to talk about the different runtime complexities, at least at the mo uh, about the most important ones, like log n and log n, uh, so logarithmic, pseudo-linear, linear, linear uh, cubic, quadratic, exponential, factorial, and so on. We're going to compare these asymptotically, visually, mathematically,
and that's what we're going to do in the next video. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it and thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.